So we are here with John Thompson from Sanctus Church in the Toronto area in Canada. John, what's up? How are you, man? I'm okay. How are you guys? Doing well. We are down here in our global headquarters Mm -hmm. of Vast in the- (laughs) Vast uh... Media Global Headquarters. (laughs) The basement of our church building. Awesome. And the nursing mother's room. Yes, exactly. Our microphones are- Microphones pretty much being propped up on a diaper changing table. (laughs) So Great. we're uh it's it's not the TBN studios it's but it's uh it's close it's prestige worldwide uh, it's good to be here with you sir and um big fan of your work and uh recently finished up your book Convergence um which uh we're actually about to have our lead team jump into and great do a bit of a deep dive into spiritual gifts which I'm excited about one of the main reasons we wanted to have you on to the podcast uh was uh to have a conversation around and I I believe the term you would use, and please correct me, which I don't, I know you don't need that invitation. You have a strong personality. You're going to correct me this whole time, and I welcome it. <laughs> uh, demonic oppression. Is that, am I using the right word, demonic oppression? Uh, there's three terms in scripture that might be helpful for the audience if that's what we're going to fully talk about. Yeah, it is. There's, yeah. One is oppression, one is possession, and one is demonization. And those are three very different things. Great. I love it. Okay. We're definitely going to go there. Why don't we start off with maybe just a little bit of some of who you are uh, so that our audience can get to know you and then we'll dive into some of the bigger dialogue. Yeah. So uh, my name is John, as you said, and I'm the senior pastor of a church called Sanctus uh, up here in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I've been on staff here for 23 years. I've done my whole ministry run here. Um, 46 years old. I got three kids, 14, 12, and 10. I've been married since 2000. Uh, to my awesome wife, Joanna, who I really appreciate. And uh, yeah, just some context, because it's probably more of an American audience listening to this. Toronto is the fourth largest uh, city in North America. It is the most multicultural city on earth. There's over 300 heart languages spoken here every single day. So our food culture is freaking awesome (laughs) here because we have the whole world. And unlike sort of the American model where uh, people come from all around the world, and it becomes sort of like a melting pot. Actually, mm-hmm. here people retain their distinctions, mm-hmm. so it truly is pluralistic. Um, and it's also probably one of the most um, liberal cities on earth, and probably one of the most post-Christian cities, or de-Christian cities, or renewed pagan cities, depending on where you are mm-hmm. in your mm-hmm. view, mm-hmm. Uh, in North America. Not within the West, but definitely within North America. I just got to chase that rabbit trail really quick. Can you pull some sure. of those apart for us? De-Christian, post-Christian, and renewed pagan. Yeah. So de- de-Christian is we know Christianity and it, we don't think it works. Post-Christian is what is Christianity? And neo-pagan is the rediscovery of what we used to be pre-Christianity, mm-hmm. which seems new, which is actually really, really old. Mm. And so um, definitely within uh, Canadian culture, there's a repaganization. Um, I've always said for years and years and years, you can get your theology from Luther, from Geneva, but you should be reading the Church Fathers because they actually are the closest people we have within the Western uh, part of Christian history, not mm-hmm. the global, but that have actually lived through what we're now re-experiencing again. So Corinth, uh, Rome, and a few other places. I think I've heard Mark Sayers talk a little bit about that. It could be him. I might be um, mistaken. The idea that post-Christianity is not all that different from pre-Christianity. Is that yeah, kind of actually, what you're talking uh, about? Totally. Um, I, I I don't I, – I know Mark. I haven't listened to his podcast lately, so I'm not stealing his thunder. But the Australian experience and the Canadian experience are very, very similar. Mm. Um, and so we're probably living in very similar things. Yeah, it's just the rediscovery of – uh, of what was during Rome and Corinth moments. Mm. And it feels so new, but it's actually very, very old. Why do you think Australia and Canada are in similar junctures? Well, we're both, uh, if you just do sociological research, mm-hmm. um, we're very similar nations. We're almost comparable, except they are more hawkish. So by personality, they're much more American mm. uh, and we're much more British. Um so Canadian culture is we're like second cousins to y'all, um, and but we're more on the British side. But mm-hmm. the 
the sort of tenacity and in-your-faceness of Australians go more towards you guys. America. Okay. But because we're, we're Commonwealth and there's a lot of similarities between us. Mm-hmm. We're just not a nation that was rooted in a jail. So there is right. a difference. No, really, Australia yeah. was. Yeah, right? I know. I mean, I'm, a, I'm Australian. Not, you can't tell yeah, by well, my accent, but I was born there. Yeah. And that, of course, is those who were enforced there. I'm not talking about the original communities, of course, that were there. Yes, absolutely. Um, would you say that the the idea of being in that renewed pagan cultural moment, is that hopeful for you? Like to me, that um, kind of gives me a sense of excitement. Yeah. So, you know, it does. And since the early 90s uh, up here, some of us have been saying that the the post-Christian moment and the renewed pagan moment is going to purify the church because there's no cultural advantage of being a Christian mm-hmm. uh, because you'll just be a Christian because you're mm. a Christian because there's no, there's no uh, reason to be a Christian other than you want to follow Jesus and bring his kingdom on earth. So yes, uh, I would say that it's very exciting. What I would say is I said that in the mid nineties when there was still cultural advantage and cultural advantages disappearing here at a monumental rate. And actually I think COVID has exacerbated it by 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's great from a kingdom perspective. It sucks if you like safety and security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those cultural advantages are? Because maybe some people would have trouble placing that. Yeah, like uh, basically just if you think about church as the center of society moving to the margins of society, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh, we, we give to our church and we get a tax receipt from the government. Isn't mm-hmm. that uh, – that's a cultural advantage mm-hmm. that – we're up here preparing for for us not necessarily to have. Mm, Uh, You know, there are things like um, Christianity was viewed as a good moral force and then culture became apathetic, but now it's actually moving to hostility. It's it's viewing Mm -hmm. uh, basic Christian teachings with suspicion. And now there are moments and only moments where it's even phrases like it is un-Canadian or against Mm -hmm. uh, the values of our country or the value of our society to believe that thing. So I want to be very careful. There's a lot of um, uh, extreme sort of fundamentalist Christians who are ratcheting up the conversation beyond what it is right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, it's getting interesting up here. Yeah, there's some semblance of truth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah persecution's on a sliding scale. It's not I'm being murdered or in jail or nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and and so we have to think about a sliding scale that's realistic mm-hmm. uh, and honest. And mm-hmm. yeah, there are the genuine beginnings mm-hmm. of some really interesting, difficult stuff up here. Mm-hmm. How far out do you think America is from that? Uh, depends where you live. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that uh, one of the advantages slash disadvantages you have is the amount of Christians you have. Mm-hmm. So just by bulk of population, there's still lots of you. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's only 37 million people up here in my country. So, mm. uh, you know, when you just start even thinking about that, there just isn't the bulk of people, uh, even if there were many Christians to have the influence. Now I know because post Trump and all of what's happening down there, I think the, the de Christian moments uh, is growing at a mm-hmm. massive rate and you might end up there much quicker than mm-hmm. people anticipated pre COVID, but <clears throat> it's coming. And it's going to be stark when it happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Thanks go in peace. Enough. Have a great day. Have a great <laughs> I, I, I was about to say, I was just, you know, like, where do I need to, to move? I'm moving to Alabama or uh, Texas or what do we, what do we do? <laughs> well, certainly uh, that stuff isn't happening purely in a materialistic sense. We have a supernatural worldview and yep. uh, we think that God is involved in all of it. And so we're going to trust in him, uh, but also look to him for how we are to act and operate. And I guess that's part of today's conversation uh, to varying degrees. Um, we want to talk to you about the the demonization, demonic oppression, demonic possession mm-hmm. conversation. Um, sure. As I understand it, you view all of that as uh, connected to a conversation around gifts of the Holy Spirit. Is that right? 
Yeah, I mean, they are semi-connected in the sense that uh, one conversation probably will lead to the other. So uh, when you start having one conversation, the other one starts appearing. So, of, of course, because where there's darkness, there's light uh, for now, mm -hmm. and where there's light, there's darkness. So, yes, there is an absolute connection. Okay, so talk us through that a little bit more. Yeah, so let me let me start with the gift conversation and then maybe get to the other thing. I, one of the things that we started looking at years ago up here, realizing that this de-Christian moment was coming, is we started asking ourselves the question, how in the world are we going to thrive and not just hunger down and survive mm -hmm. in this post-Christian moment? And so one of the things that I started doing is trying to research every generation of Christians that I could in, the, in, our, in our global experience to see how they did well during times of grand transition where the mm -hmm. church did not have advantage. And what struck me was that uh, spiritual disciplines and spiritual gifts rose to the surface automatically. Uh, because, uh, when you don't have an advantage, that means that you don't have governmental backing. It doesn't mean you have large churches necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean you have great personalities and that there isn't money. And so if you don't have to use our words today, great platform or great authority, then you're left with you, which will be a failure. Unless of course, mm. there's this other <laughs> dimension, which is actually uh, supernatural. So great. So one of the things we start asking is, well, how do we deal with this? And then that journey of starting to talk about spiritual gifts in a conservative, evangelical, non-charismatic con context then led us to a real understanding of the Trinity and how Jesus used gifts, which blew our mind. Then we defined gifts. Then people started using gifts. Then renewal took place in our church. And, and then connected to that, dealing with the demonic started happening because of certain gifts and certain experiences. So, you know, it's the chicken and the egg, no matter where you want to start. I but I think just for the beginning of the conversation, putting all the theological baggage aside and all the arguments, the thing that I think we need to realize is Jesus used spiritual disciplines to listen to the Father. Jesus used spiritual gifts, which we can talk about today or at another time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but the point is he modeled that as the essence of ministry. And since that's true, local churches have to model those two things at their core because that's actually the well you need to draw on when there's nothing left. And actually, you should be drawing on it when there's everything on the table mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, so when HR fails and when in the sense of like HR and strategy and the right leader and all that doesn't work or isn't, you know, the thing that changes culture – then you get back to only Jesus can change culture. Mm. And how do I participate with Jesus? Well, it's actually through spiritual gifts. But then if you're doing that, then you have to say, well, what are the gifts and how are they used and how are they interconnected? And mm -hmm. then the conversation spirals in a good way. Yeah. I, one of the things that came to mind for me as I was reading your book, Convergence, um, was that you seem to view spiritual gifts as like the principal organizing feature of the church. Whereas maybe some people tend to think of gifts as uh, uh, an, either A is like ceased, so that's one end of the spectrum, or further down towards our end of the spectrum as something that's like good, healthy outgrowth of a good, healthy church, his spiritual gifts being used. But it seemed to me like your view of them was like, no, these are fundamental to the way a church is organized and uh whether or not a church is going to be effective at fulfilling the Great Commission. Is that accurate? That's right. 100%. And, and the reason why is because I am, I am totally convinced that Jesus used them. And mm -hmm. so if you want to do this little brief thing, like if you, if you honestly take Scripture at face value, there's some really interesting moments in the book of John. Jesus says, you know, you know things like, I do nothing except what the Father tells me to do. Mm -hmm. Another moment he says, you know, if you if you follow me, you'll do the same things I've been doing. And I read those two verses and I'm just like, I don't believe that. <laughs> I mean, I just don't believe that. That's just not true. I don't see that in my church. And I and and because I'm such a strong Trinitarian, I didn't understand why why was Jesus, um, who is, you know, co equal with the Father and and himself God, mm -hmm. uh, why was he only doing what the Father wanted him to do? And so one of the questions I started wrestling down is between Christmas and Easter. How did, how did Jesus do ministry? And if you read Philippians 2, Philippians 2 is this incredible, there's that famous hymn in there. Mm -hmm. And, it's, it, you know, and do you mind if I read it? Are you okay with that? I just... Absolutely. Uh, Go for it. Please do. Yeah, because this is, was the starting moment for me where I always talk about going from upstairs to downstairs. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because you got to work up your theology upstairs and downstairs. So it's this famous thing about humility and serving each other, but it's rooted in Jesus. And it says, verse Philippians 2, 6, so who being in very nature God, which by the way, never forget Paul, who's a pharisaical rabbi, 30 years after the resurrection is actually claiming that Jesus from Nazareth shares the nature of God, which is a claim he is God because there's only one being that has the DNA of God. Like mm -hmm. in itself is revolutionary and shocking. And then the next verse is, uh, next part is, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or to be grasped. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, so, you know, in one breath, you're equal to Yahweh in the next breath, but you're not using that advantage, whatever that means. And then, well, how in the song goes, you know, he made himself nothing, taking on the uh, nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, uh, humbled himself, became obedient to death, death on the cross. Therefore, God exalts him to the highest place, gives, gives him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, so that's amazing, and that's all true. So the question I started asking is, okay— but how did Jesus not use his advantage of being God between mm -hmm. Christmas and Easter? Mm -hmm. And then when I started reading Luke, it got really wild where Jesus, you know, at his baptism, suddenly the Holy Spirit is lightning on him. And I'm like, why in the world does Jesus need the Holy Spirit? Like he's God. He, you know, he, the, why does the second person of the Trinity need the third person? Well, yes, to affirm his identity. But then Mark's account says the Holy Spirit forced Jesus into the wilderness. And I'm like, why is the third person of the Trinity push it literally reads in Greek pushing Jesus into mm -hmm. the wilderness and then after that he comes out empowered by the spirit and then the light bulb went on and we were like oh <laughs> Jesus chose to not cling to the advantages of his godness though he remained God in other words his essence didn't change but he shut off the god tap mm -hmm. and he basically functioned as a perfect human being mm -hmm. well how do you do that well he's filled with the spirit well what does that mean well he used spiritual gifts which then clarifies how we can imitate Jesus, like saying in John, because if Jesus is God, I can't be him. He's God. Mm -hmm. But if Jesus remains God, but chooses not to access his divinity, doing all those amazing things, but is under the power of the spirit using spiritual gifts, then of course we can be like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Of course we can. Mm -hmm. And that was revolutionary for us. Cause then we were like, if Jesus models for an everyday Christian in a local church, that though he is divine and never stops being God, but cho chose to do ministry only under God the Father, what do you want me to do, Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, gifts, well, then I can imitate him. And if that's the center of his ministry, then it has to be the center of, of, of the ministry of the church. That's why we're called the body of Christ. That's mm -hmm. why Paul uses the image of the body. That's why, like, it all makes sense when you root it in the Gospels and Philippians and see that Jesus did not, so in other words, when Jesus healed people, he had the gift of healing. He didn't do it out of his divinity. When Jesus cast out demons, mm. he didn't do it out of his divinity. He had the gift of miracles. When Jesus taught, he was using the gift of teaching. When he went to go to get Zacchaeus, you know, Jesus is always spending time with God the Father. You'll notice this in the Gospels. He's always leading, leaving when the most epic moments are happening. It's like revival, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000. He's like, I'm out. The disciples are like, you can't be out. This is the best platform you've ever had. Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah, I got to go. And most people say, oh, he was tired. Yeah. But he's always praying. Well, what is he asking? Well, where do you want me to go? So the story of Zacchaeus would be like, so where do you want me to go? Because he doesn't know. He doesn't know where he wants to go. Remember, Jesus didn't even know when he was coming back, mm -hmm. but I thought he was God, mm -hmm. right? So, so where do you want me to go? Oh, you want me to go to Jericho? And who do you want me to meet? Oh, oh, a, a wee little man. How we? A wee little man was he? And where's he going to be? Oh, he's going to be up a second more. Like Jesus only did what God the Father told him, and he only did it by the power of the Holy Spirit between Christmas and Easter, mm -hmm. which means he used disciplines to hear and gifts to do the thing. And why does that matter? Because then if that's the center point and Paul outlines and Peter outlines what gifts are, then they have to be the center point of every local church because mm -hmm. that's actually what Jesus modeled. Hmm. Do you, so in that, do you draw any delineation between our relationship to the Holy Spirit and Jesus's relationship to the Holy Spirit? Are they at all different? Well, of course, I mean, functionally, of course, they're different. <laughs> we, he, they, he is one. They're God. He is mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. But the way that Jesus was filled by the Spirit 
we we can be exactly the same. The character of the spirit, being led by the spirit, being filled mm -hmm. by the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, and the gifts of the spirit. Mm -hmm. That is the invitation. That is how we get to be like Christ on earth. One hundred percent. No other way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. No other way. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why this is all important beyond some theological conversation is because when you bring spiritual gifts to the table, you're not bringing you to the table. Right. You're not the well you're drinking from. Mm -hmm. So if you have the gift of mercy and I don't have the gift of mercy, there'll be more power in the room to do the will of God because the spirit of God is present to do that thing. Mm -hmm. That's how you imitate Christ. And that's how we imitate Christ together. I don't have all 21 gifts, but we together, the body of Christ, have all 21 gifts and get to do the things that Jesus did and even greater things. Because mm -hmm. there's more of us, by the way. Is that what you interpret Jesus to me when he says greater works than these you'll do? Is it yes. uh, a breadth thing, not a depth thing? It's a breadth and a depth thing. Mm -hmm. And and remember, uh, it's not just to the apostles. Anyone who believes in me shall do these things. Mm -hmm. But the problem in charismatic circles is most people read that verse and make it me. They take the the you mm -hmm. will as a singular you, but it's mm -hmm. a plural you. It's mm -hmm. you all, y'all, mm -hmm. y'all are Texas. Mm -hmm. Y'all are going to do this. Mm -hmm. And so this is why gifts are so important because when you start identifying gifts in people, they know what their gifts are. They know what their gifts are not. It creates interdependence. It begins mm -hmm. to empower people. People start actually functioning in a power source they don't have. That's not natural to them. Because mm -hmm. remember, natural gifts and acquired gifts are important, but aren't guaranteed places of power mm -hmm. at all. And it by natural all... and acquired, you mean like skills? Nat nat yeah. yeah, well, natural gifts you're born with. People right. are born smart with math. They're born right. athletes. You yeah. can go to school and learn all this stuff, but the Holy Spirit is not needed to be a basketball player. You right. don't need the Holy Spirit to do astrophysics. You don't. But you sure need that. You sure need the Holy Spirit to preach. Right. Mm -hmm. You sure need the Holy Spirit to have mercy. And so this is why this this is why this is so significant in the post Christian moment, because this is guaranteed power. And it doesn't matter if there's money. And it doesn't matter if there's platform. It just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's guaranteed power. And if you're going to face down darkness and you're going to face down hostility and apathy in a culture and make a difference. We have to bring guaranteed power. power. But if you don't work really hard at gift understanding and rooting it in the Trinity, everyone will reduce it back to what you said, a Sunday school classroom mm -hmm. where let's do a gift test together and isn't this cool and five of us care and let's get back to our programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about that, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to ask. Go ahead, Mike. Well, I, I think hearing about all of this, um, I mean, I've taken, you know, dozens of those tests and had dozens, of course, across the 20 something years I've been a Christian now, right? And and uh, got saved in a church that was very all about the different giftings. Um, I guess my question is, yeah, if someone is listening to this going, well, what's my gift? <laughs> what is the best way for them to unpack that? And before I let you answer the question, here's how I've seen that mostly work or in, in, in my life. Uh, most of the time it has been through generally like a prophetic word, somebody that I really respect that's speaking into my life that sees something in me that like brings something up in my spirit of, oh yeah, that resonates, right? Um, it's generally never been something I've like discovered. Th there, there wasn't this like light bulb moment. There's just like these little confirmations along the way. Um, is that kind of what, is that how people find it? I, I guess, give me some kind of practical framework for how do we find out what that yeah, is? Yeah, if it is the principal organizing feature, how do you organize it? <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause, cause yeah. for me, and I, the reason I ask is like, I feel like I know what God's gifted me at because I've just been the dude my whole life that at the conference or at the, whatever, some incredible, you know, um, instrument of God just has essentially said, mm -hmm. this is what God is, mm -hmm. has called you to do. This is who God has called you to be. Um, but I don't think that's a lot of people's mm -hmm. story necessarily. So Especially um, right. if they don't go to those kinds of Especially churches. Especially if they don't go to those kinds of <laughs> church, you know, or, or, or mm -hmm. you know, haven't been um, able to be in that kind of environment. So how does someone find their spiritual gift? So first of all, you ask Jesus, and I'm not joking. Mm -hmm. Like the amount of people listening right now who have never sat before the Lord Jesus and said, how have you gifted me? Mm -hmm. And how have you not gifted me? Mm -hmm. By the way, it would be a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Romans 12 is very clear that he gets to choose what you get. This is not a buffet where you choose up and say, I'm a, I'm going to, I want prophecy, administration, and mercy today. Like, <laughs> not what we've got. Uh, second of all, where you're pissed off is where you're gifted. 
So mm-hmm. where you're consistently angry in a church context usually is a sign where you're gifted. Mm-hmm. Every teacher wants people to read more. Every leader wants to take another hill. Every administrator wants a plan. Every merciful person can't believe leaders don't care about poor people more. Every prayer person <laughs> can't believe we're not praying more. So mm-hmm. where you're angry in a church context is almost always where you're gifted. That's why First Corinthians 13 is so important. Mm-hmm. It's wedged between 12 and 14, which is all about gifts. Mm-hmm. Because Paul understands the greater gift is love. Mm-hmm. And he also understands that love is the thing that grounds the gifts. But where you're gifted is where you're angry. The rule of dots is another one. Why does this keep happening to me? So uh, once a community understands, has an agreed upon definition of all 21 gifts, which is very important in a post-denominational pre-Christian, what I say prophecy and you say prophecy, what do we even mean? So you've got to do a lot of work Mm -hmm. for a community to do that well. But um, the rule of dots, almost every person thinks the other person's experience is theirs. So Mm -hmm. you're like, you know, you talk to a prayer person, oh, how was your prayer life this week? And they're like, you know, you know, you know, it was, I only prayed three hours a day. And you're like, three hours a day, I (laughs) blessed my McDonald's and what? And then they go, well, you don't pray through hours. Like, mm-hmm. So the rule of dots is why does this keep happening to me again and again? But you'll never discover that unless you're in community. Right. Because you think it's normal. You think it's normal until mm-hmm. someone goes, well, I don't do that. Now, mm-hmm. that's where a gift tension shows up. We got to be very careful. You don't turn around and go, well, what's wrong with your spiritual life? Mm-hmm. Because when you understand spiritual gifts and when you realize they're sovereignly inside it, aside and, and when you realize actually you have no choice, suddenly I'm not supposed to speak in tongues necessarily if you do. And, oh, I might not teach, but I actually have mercy. And when that begins to work out, suddenly it builds unity in the church because you don't start imposing your gift view on another person who God has not sovereignly gifted that way. Mm-hmm which brings unity to the church and gets rid of a lot of battles in the church that aren't personality-based, they're gift-based, which is a very significant ongoing trauma in the church. And it's been done for years and years and years. So where you're angry, why does this keep happening to me? Uh, you need you need to pray about it. And the problem with gift, uh, uh, gift tests mm-hmm. is it presumes you've had the experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It always says, have you done this? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. I've never prayed for a dead person to be raised from the dead, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. Or if I don't go to a charismatic church, how would I know if I have interpretation of tongues if no one's smoking tongues in front of me? Mm-hmm. I'll never know. Mm-hmm. So the problem with gift tests are they're reactive. So the other thing that churches need to do is set up environments to actually see where the gifts are in the people. But that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, I remember you talking about that in your book. We, we could yeah. talk, yeah, this conversation alone could be its own two and a half hour yeah. episode, which would be incredible, yeah. but people should read your book um, if they want to know more. And I'm sure many pastors do because it's very intriguing stuff. Um, let's connect this to the, the uh, conversation around uh, uh, demons. Yeah. What's the bridge? Yeah. So the bridge is that we live in a, an organic universe, not a materialistic universe alone. Organic, I mean, God, angels, demons, and humans, and mm. you know we organically interact, uh, and and so one of the things that gets really interesting and intriguing is when you are facing down supernatural evil. Um, there are a certain group of gifts that actually help very well with that conversation. So our discover of discovery of gifts in a non charismatic, conservative, Willow esque historical church happened when we started in youth group praying for people who mm-hmm. were demonized that we didn't know what to do with and all these gifts started emerging now let me just say it like this there's when you're dealing with the demonic there's just four lo- there's four different authorities there's common authority ephesians 2 says that each christian is seated with christ in the heavenly realms mm-hmm. and that means that we have authority you know james Chapter four, submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil, he must flee. So every Christian is possessed by the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've uh, thought about that. Every Christian on earth is possessed uh, by a sentient being that is not human, that has its own mind, Mm -hmm. uh, and his name is the Holy Spirit. So Mm -hmm. every Christian on earth is possessed by a spirit, just the Mm -hmm. right one. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's one of the best ways to think about it. And so we have common authority that has been given to the church. So if the demonic show up, we can say in Jesus' name, leave. It might not happen in seconds. It might happen over an extended period of time because the fight is real. The second type of authority is office authority. The elders, pastors, and leaders, they do have an authority that God has given them that the demonic respect. 
uh, the third authority is no matter where you land in the egalitarian complementarian conversation, uh, which is extensive and important, um, there is something about uh, husbands having spiritual authority. It's just mm -hmm. in scripture. It's there and it's rooted in creation. Mm -hmm. One of the best ways we talk about that is husbands are called to hold the umbrella over their wife. So they have two hands to do more for the kingdom, not less. It's not a domination thing. It's a spiritual thing. Okay. Um, and we have women pastors here, by the way. And like, that's just a thing. Mm -hmm. We're fine with that. And then Michael the last barely lets gift. his wife take off her head covering, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were hoping you could address it. Great. <laughs> I will not address any of that. Uh, thank you. I'll just let you all deal with your, your stuff. Uh, and, uh, the fourth thing is gift authority where you're spiritually gifted is where you have more authority. And so there are mm. four or five spiritual gifts that interact well when people are trying to be set free. One of them is discernment, discernment of spirits and discernment of spirits. It's brought up in first John. It's talked about in the, in the gift passages. And the way we work it out here is discernment has three directions you can go up, down, or to the side. Certain people with a spiritual gift of discernment know when God is in the room. They just know. They just know when God is close or he's present. Or if you want to say he moves from omnipresence to palpability. And that's all they know. Other people have uh, discernment where the Holy Spirit reveals to them wrong motives. Everything looks right. Everything sounds right. The theology is right. The motives are not right. You're just like something is wrong with this person, though everything is correct. Mm. The third version of discernment is when evil is in the room. Now, wh what's really important to understand is, number one, we're not witches or psychics. And so... One of the rules in a Christian understanding of spiritual gifts is we don't own our gifts. I, I don't speak into, it's not my tongues. It's not my discernment. The Holy Spirit revealed the source of something for a reason. So if you have discernment, you need to ask, Lord, why did you show me this? You didn't discern it. He showed you it. And it's a completely different worldview. And many Christians almost functionally start acting like witches. I discern this. This is my understanding. It's not your understanding. And you need to say, because all the gifts are to help build up the body of Christ, right? Bring the kingdom of God. Why did you reveal this? And the people with discernment also need to learn how to stop, drop, and roll. Just because the Lord revealed something doesn't mean you're supposed to act. You need to ask, why did you tell me and what do you want me to do with it? Lots of people with discernment do a lot of damage because they run to people and say, you need to do this. And I saw this. And it's just like, whoa, 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 breathe, 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 breathe. Mm. And so people with discernment... um, can some have go all three directions, but lots of people only go one or two directions. So my experience with discernment is up and down, but never to the side, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, and why does that matter? Well, uh, mental illness is very real. We believe in that. We work with people who genuinely have mental illness organically or chemically. Um, and so even to do the understanding, what's the difference between a mental illness and the presence of demonic or actually are both present, you need some people that you trust that have gift of discernment. People with discernment sometimes can see the demonic, hear the demonic, or just sense when they're present. Hmm. So that's like one very strong uh, spiritual gift. One of the other rules just for your audience to think through is um, the spirit of Christ and the spirit of Antichrist look exactly the same and function the same. And so any spiritual gift that you had before you were converted isn't from our side. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you had... Some kind of so if you, you had like discernment prophetic... experiences before you were saved, mm -hmm. it's not from us. Mm -hmm. It's not from our side. So that was you, gonna. You, sorry, yeah, go ahead. You get this. You you get the spiritual gifts when the spirit of God comes into you. Mm -hmm. He's Got the it. one who endows you with the gifts. And mm -hmm. so I've talked to many many people who have discernment like experiences their whole life, then become Christians, and then go, oh, this this is just discernment. I'm like, mm, mm -hmm. actually, yes, it is. But the power source, the the plug not from our side. You need to mm -hmm. get that over. Mm -hmm. So discernment is one of the most important ones. Uh, of course, miracles is another one. And miracles is different than healing. If you read Paul, he distinguishes the two. Mm -hmm. Healing is physical, healing or emotional. Miracles is authority over nature, death, and the demonic. And so people that have the gift of um, miracles, for example, are great confronters to tell the demonic to leave because they have an endowed authority over those things. Now, Anyone could tell the demonic to leave, but if you're going to do this long term, the gift of miracles is a really strong advantage because there's a greater umph, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Just like a great preacher. We've all sat with preachers, right? And we've gone, wow, um, thanks for doing that. You shouldn't preach again. 
Like, thanks for teaching. <laughs> but just don't, don't do that yeah. again. Yeah. I thought uh, you were going because... in a totally different direction. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? You're just like, wow, like that. Thank, thank you for using the discipline of teaching, but you are not gifted. So the same with the demonic. Like when you're doing this ministry, having the gift of miracles isn't always necessary, but helpful. So those are like two examples of how the gifts really help in that type of context. The discern words of knowledge is another really critical one. Words of knowledge is when the Holy Spirit gives information that you have no access to that brings someone's healing or hu uh, humbling, but never humiliates them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of charismatic circles get discernment and words of knowledge confused. Uh, discernment is source. Where is it coming from? Words of knowledge is information. So one of the best passages to work out is when Peter confronts Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. And Peter says to Ananias, you've lied about the money you've brought, word of knowledge, mm -hmm. and Satan has filled your heart, discernment. Mm -hmm. Totally two different things. One's the door opening event. The other thing is what walked through the door. Mm -hmm. So those gifts are really helpful uh, when trying to systematically help people be set free from the presence of the demonic. That's so, one of the connections out of a thousand. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about people getting set free from the presence of the demonic, as I understand it, you're not strictly speaking about people who are not followers of Jesus. You are including Christians in that. Yeah. So, um, okay. Uh, this we'll gets to the like, sixty-four thousand we'll, we'll question. We'll, right? we'll throw out like fourteen grenades, and then I'll just walk away. And perfect. I don't know what you'll do. With That's exactly time. what this podcast is for. <laughs> Great. Perfect. So, um, number one, I, I, let me just be really clear: every Christian on Earth is oppressed. We we live between the first and second coming of Jesus, and so there are three enemies. Uh, that are all spiritual, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Mm -hmm. The world is multiple different systems that oppress God, by the way, and worldliness is as much democratic as it is Republican. It is left and right. Don't buy into the lie that one is just, I'm telling you, worldliness takes on many forms. Mm -hmm. uh, as sin is our own struggles, and then the demonic are sentient fallen beings. So every Christian is oppressed and is invited into sin by external forces, mm -hmm. worldliness, sin, the demonic. Uh, possession is positional, and this is really important. So you're either owned by Jesus or the kingdom of darkness right now. Right. Period. Second Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel who is in Jesus Christ. I, just, not one non-Christian on earth has the ability to see Jesus. Can't right. do it. Why? Because they're blinded by the demonic. Not mm -hmm. only that, if you read Ephesians 2, it is clear every single non-Christian is owned by the dominion of darkness. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how sincere they are, how nice they are. So possession, possession meaning ownership, is positional. And you're either owned by the lamb or you're owned by the dragon, mm -hmm. whether you believe in the lamb or the dragon or not. Mm -hmm. And then so Ephesians is such an important book because... Ephesians 1 says that God calls Christians, adopts Christians, forgives Christians, and then, of course, says and seals Christians into the day of redemption. Uh, Ephesians 2 says, one, that happens in your life. If you're a Christian, you're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 3 says uh, that you are, uh, God chose to use the church uh, to basically be the billboard of Satan's defeat. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all positional, possessional statements. So that's true. Now, the question is, can Christians have an internal influence of the demonic in their life while they are possessionally possessed upstairs? By God, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the answer is 100%. Mm -hmm. And that's what you would refer to as— So you can as... be elected, saved, predestined, adopted, owned, sealed by the Holy Spirit— mm -hmm and still have a demonic influence inside. And we see this in multiple places in the scripture. One of the most important ones is in Luke 13, where pre-cross, you have Jesus in a synagogue. A woman uh, has a medical back issue, and she's bent over, and she can't stand up for 18 years. Mm -hmm. She has reverse hunch hunchback. Luke is a medical doctor, so of course he gets this. And then Jesus heals her, and... Mm -hmm. 
the pastors are very upset because the healing happens on the wrong day. Mm -hmm. uh, and the people are very excited and she's dancing around. And then when Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, it's very insightful. He says, um, this daughter of Abraham has been bound by Satan for 18 long years. Why does that matter? Number one, you didn't just join. There's no seeker sensitive synagogues. You don't come in with your latte and your name card. <laughs> if you're in a, if you're in a, if you're in a synagogue, you're, you're a known person. You have to be invited in and you're in community. So this woman is in God's house under the Old Testament, which is still living and active. And she is in right relationship with God in community. She's accepted there in Jewish standards, but she's called the daughter of Abraham. Mm -hmm. She's the only woman in the Bible to be called the daughter of Abraham. There's nowhere else. Mm -hmm. And daughter of Abraham in Luke does not mean Jewish mm -hmm. or neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's a salvific statement. Mm -hmm. So it's Jesus a says, this woman who is, to use our vernacular, saved, mm -hmm. has been internally affected by a demon for 18 long years mm -hmm. that has actually produced hunchback. Mm -hmm. So you're like, Jeez. hold on a second. How is that possible? And then if you start doing your homework, you'll realize that the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, had five words for ownership. They were really serious about owning things. They were materialists. They loved, they loved mm -hmm. their things, right? Mm -hmm. So um, every time you see the word had a demon or were possessed by a demon in the New Testament, in all the Gospels especially, not one of those five words is ever used. Mm. I got to say this again. So I'm going to slow down mm -hmm. and say this again for your audience. Mm -hmm. When I say the word possessed, you automatically think ownership. These are my glasses. Mm -hmm. So you go, John owns those glasses. Mm -hmm. But every time you see the word possessed, owned, possessed, that's what we think, right? Mm -hmm. In Greek, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, it never means owned. It just means they had. So stop equating possession, ownership with just, it's just to have. So you have a woman who's in synagogue under the written word of God with Jesus the Messiah in the room. She is called salvation saved because remember Zacchaeus, when he repented and had Jesus house, Jesus says, today truly you've become a son of Abraham. It is a salvific statement. Mm -hmm. Though you're ethnically Jewish, you now know the living God. Mm -hmm. So you have a woman who's demonized, but not possessed. And then you realize all the words don't mean ownership. And then you get back. Then you get to Ananias and Sapphira, who, by the way, were Christians, and Satan filled their hearts. And then you get to Ephesians, where it says in Ephesians 4, after all those amazing positional statements, uh, do not, in your anger, let the sun go down and give the devil a foothold. foothold. Mm -hmm. And the word foothold is topos. It's used 83 times in the New Testament, and 98.5% of the usages are, are room, region, place, or space. So that's why Paul says, though you're elected, saved, uh, adopted, sealed until the day of redemption, a billboard of Satan's defeat, and of course, Ephesians chapter 2, right, see with Christ, though that's all positionally true upstairs, down here, if you play with fire, you actually can open up the demonic to have a foothold in you, but not own you. Right. That's why it says in, in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the spirit of God who you've been sealed until the day of redemption. And so the image he uses, is, uh, the example he uses is anger, but it could be many things. And he says, uh, a Christian who is in right standing with God, the father through Jesus by the spirit, if habitually involved in anger, which notice is not an occultic thing, it's anger, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. will give a demonic being foothold presence in their life. So think about a house and it's like a squatter into the house. They don't own the house, but they are in the house because there's a left bedroom window that is open. And now they have influence in the house or impact in the house, but they don't own the house. Why does this matter? Because there are millions of Christians who have been taught their whole life that that is impossible. Mm -hmm. Right. And then if it's not possible, and then they have all these experiences, then they don't know what to do. And then they become very defeated, broken Christians. And so is that, th this is what you would sum up as being demonized. Is that right? That's right. Because that's actually what the Greek word means, mm -hmm. to be tormented or to have, mm -hmm. not to be owned. Mm -hmm. We're positionally owned by Satan or positionally owned by, by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, non-Christians, of course, can be 
possessed upstairs and downstairs, right? right. Legion's a great example of that. Mm -hmm. Christians can be possessed by the Holy Spirit upstairs and be demonized downstairs. We would never say, oh, that's it. You know what? You screwed up John once, so you're, you're not a Christian. We go, no, you sinned. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit of God was removed, no, grieved. Mm -hmm. If I commit to worldliness, I'd go, oh my goodness, like the Spirit of God is grieved. I don't lose my salvation immediately. So this, why have we elevated evil, the demonic, to be something more than the other two enemies that are just as bad? Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit doesn't leave. The Holy Spirit is grieved. Mm -hmm. And of course, Christians can, again, get help and repent and deal with stuff and be set free. Mm -hmm. But this actually goes to one of the main reasons why the church is so weak and ineffective is because we have been teaching our people, whether it's Pentecostal settings, Baptist settings, or other settings, that this is an impossibility. And actually, it's a very strong possibility. It is all throughout Scripture, and it's highly weakened the church. Can you maybe just, because um, as you're talking, I'm trying to think through, okay, so people are listening to this, and if they're anything like me, they're going, oh, wow, have I been demonized mm -hmm. at some point in my life? How did... Well, the answer for you is... I mean, definitely the answer for me is absolutely yes. yes. Um, no, maybe give me... So you use the example of you know a home and a, a squatter in the home and a window being left yeah. open. So can you give some examples of like, what are some of those windows sometimes that people sure. regularly leave open? And then if someone's listening to this, genuinely going, man, am I... I'm dealing with X, Y, or Z. Am I, am I demonized? How does somebody navigate that? And what are some of the common, for lack of a better term, symptoms... Uh, sure. of someone that may be demonized? Well, first of all, um, if you read Ephesians 4 carefully, he uses multiple examples of habitual sin. So he uses anger, brawling, lying, laziness. I mean, just read it. His point there is, is unrepentant habitual sin leads to the possibility of demonization. Um, if you read scripture cover to cover, because Paul also addresses this in 1 Corinthians, where he's like, listen, I, I, I don't want you worshiping at the with the cup of demons and the cup of the Lord, I think it's in First mm -hmm. Corinthians like ten or eleven. Uh, I think it's there. Um, so there are five areas where a demonization of a Christian can happen. Number one is habitual sin. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is um, is a false spirituality and false religion. And so, uh, if you get involved in heresy, if you get involved in in false belief, remember spiritual conflict is both intellectual worldview and experiential. So he says in First Timothy, I think, is it four? You know, even in the end times, many of the elect will be deceived by the doctrine of the teachings of the demonic. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of people who get demonized through false teaching. Uh, a, a third area is sex, and um, that's not degrading sex uh, at all. Uh, sex is not bad. It's God-given. He invented it. It's pre-fall. Adam and Eve were having sex before the fall, so it's all good. But it's so interesting in the Greek version of the Old Testament when it says, and Adam and Eve became one flesh, it actually reads in the LXX version, they shared one psyche, which is very intriguing, mm. where it talks about the bonding that happens between human beings sexually. And so when you're bonding so deeply with another human being, if there's demonic stuff present, that bonding could create, we'll say, a pathway or a, a place um, that could that could absolutely happen. So you've got false... Uh, is that false, like a transference? Um, like if one sex yeah, partner I, that's has... a very new age word. But yeah, right. yes, that's the best way of saying it. Like right. absolutely can happen, and and there's again a much larger conversation we could have about that. Uh, the fourth area is trauma, uh, where um, there are multiple. Think about you get a huge gash on your arm and you don't clean it out, then bacteria begin to grow in it and gets infected. Now, what's so uh, frustrating about this and so difficult about this? is it's not fair because most trauma, sometimes it's shared trauma, but a lot of times, a lot of trauma had nothing to do with the person. It's something done against the person. Uh, and you gotta be incredibly pastoral and careful and clinical about how you talk about this, but multiple people that have experienced sexual assault or abuse end up having the presence of the demonic through that thing. And it, it's not fair, but this is a war. And see, this is part of the problem, especially mm. with the Western church, mm. Um, we don't actually believe this is a real war. Right. We believe I'm saved and there's this bubble and I'm just protected. But, you know, you know, I was, I've been teaching our church in the last little while here. Our, our, 
our security is guaranteed mm -hmm. in the New Testament. That is, mm -hmm. um, we are sealed until, until the day of redemption and our resurrection is guaranteed, but our safety is not guaranteed because mm -hmm. um, we live in this fallen world. So that's a way that, that it absolutely can happen too. That's, you know, really difficult. Uh, and, and then you've, you've just, you've got, you've got basically um, false worldviews. So there's lots of ways the demonic can gain access to a Christian's life, those door opening events. Um, and then you say, well, how do I know? Well, it, let me say this, not every person that has sinned or struggled with this stuff or this stuff is demonized. Don't, don't go there. There's there. You, don't be a, don't mm -hmm. be an engineer and start going, what is the percentile? Uh, one of the things you need to say to Jesus is, am I demonized? Hmm. So ask him and he's a good shepherd. And if he tells you, he'll also set you free. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, a lot of times when I talk to people who struggle, it's sort of like they have a natural inclination struggle, whatever it might be. And then when the demonic are present, it's like kerosene on the fire where it just, it almost becomes, I cannot not do that thing. And when the demonic leave, you're still stuck with you, by the way. And this is really important. The, deliverance or exorcism or releasing prayer, whatever you call it, is not a magic bullet. Uh, yes, it's this powerful moment where Jesus and community sets people free. And it's amazing to see again and again and again, but you're still stuck with you. You're mm -hmm. You have to continue to walk in your God-given freedom, which is really important. Mm -hmm. That was a lot. Sorry. <clears throat> no, that was, no, that's great. The going back to some of the like the five ways that people can become demonized. Yeah. Um so like uh when Paul talks about not letting the sun go down on your anger, uh, because that creates a foothold for the devil. Uh, the other sins that are listed in that chapter or in that that segment uh, are those definitely in connection to Paul's warning of specifically attached to anger? Yeah, so we got to be really careful because what happens in Ephesians 4 is people become reductionistic and they're like, oh, anger or or brawling or lying, those are the things that provide the foothold. Mm -hmm. Paul's point is not, he uses them as examples because he's actually, remember chapter 3, 4, and 5, he's trying to build Christian unity between husbands and mm -hmm. wives, pastors, and like, he's he's trying to deal with a unity issue. Mm -hmm. Paul's point is habitual sin is a very, very dangerous moment, a door opening moment. Mm -hmm. And like Ananias and Sapphira, it's a great example. During a revival, by the way, re mm -hmm. read it. During mm -hmm. a revival, like it's thousands of people becoming Christians, Jews and Jews that hated each other pre-Jesus are working out their inner ethnic hate mm -hmm. under Jesus. Gentiles, non-Jews are starting to come in. Barnabas is selling off his his amazing cottage. I don't know where you have cottages where you all live, but you know the cottages in Malibu are being sold off, and it's unbelievable. And Jake, and has, then, a, Jake has a cottage in Malibu. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I'm sure he has too. And uh, no, but you, you understand what I'm saying, like, and then and then they lie about it, and the lie and the public deception mm -hmm. becomes the filling moment. This is why this is why so many churches struggle because everyone's like, well, you have to do the really, really bad thing for the bad thing to show up. Mm. Right. They're all bad things. <laughs> They're all sin. Yeah. Yeah. And then the sex kit thing is big because uh, with hookup culture, we should basically be we sh I don't know to what degree, but we certainly should be operating with a much higher level of awareness in terms of how demonized people might be when they come into the kingdom of God, yeah. um, because sex is so prevalent. Prevalent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's not just sex; it's violence. It's it, it's it's any again. This is why we're back to Rome. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at Rome and what they valued, which was. Uh, a constant desire for violence and war, the dehumanization of people, the love of luxury over human beings, uh, hookup culture in every direction, mm -hmm. etc. All the church fathers talked about the presence of demonization in their churches and mm -hmm. in communities because of all of these things. And now we're living in that again, but with 
with this added to it, mm-hmm. um, right? For those who are so, not watching the video, he just held up his iPhone. Yeah, this is just a, this oh, is yeah. a real uh, moment. So uh, God's work is amazing, and His forgiveness is incredible, and His love is amazing, and He's and He will save and do what He needs to do. I think the conversation we now need to have is as people are coming into the kingdom of God and all that amazing positional stuff has taken place, we need to very quickly begin to work out down here to close those doors Mm -hmm. so actually they can be free Mm -hmm. from history or present stuff to walk forward so the demonic does not have a foothold in the local church. Remember, a foothold in a person is a foothold in the local church. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is why Paul gives that warning in First Corinthians five. A hundred percent. It's you know what we do in private or what we do in secret affects our local communities mm-hmm. because we are the body of Christ. Now that's not a shaming thing, by the way. And remember, the very first thing that Adam and Eve did when when they sinned was they hid. Mm-hmm. They hid, mm-hmm. and so so many Christians are so embarrassed or shamed or feel guilty about what they've done, what they've experienced, what they're struggling with, that they continually hide. And hiddenness is the very thing that grows the presence of the demonic and gives Mm -hmm. them power. And when you, as it says in James 5, when you confess your sins to each other and pray for each other, you shall be healed. That's when hiddenness is broken. And so one of the most, you know, simple process uh, to think about is after someone switches allegiances, once you s- said Jesus is Lord and nothing else is Lord, mm-hmm. that's the game changer for the conversation because you're now, you switch sides, right? Mm-hmm. You've, you don't have 666 in your life anymore. You now have 777. Mm-hmm. You're positionally marked by the lamb. At that moment, right, then you have to start doing the truth thing. What is truth? starting closing doors, saying that I don't do that, beginning to repent. Mm -hmm. And imagine just, again, a big hallway with all these doors open. You've got all all this garbage in the hallway Mm -hmm. and there's rats eating the garbage. Well, you have to close the doors through confession Mm -hmm. of what the stuff, then you have to sweep out the garbage and then you kick out the rats. You tell them to leave in Jesus name, because the problem is lots of people, especially in charismatic circles, want to kick out the rats, but they never close the door and never dealt with the garbage. Mm -hmm. So the rats just come through another door. Why doesn't God just do all that for us? Like, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to ask that question, right? Why, why, when we get saved, and I'm not asking this in a, in a defensive way, like, no, but why, why doesn't God just, when he fills us with the Holy Spirit, because we believe that apart from the Spirit, no one can confess Jesus as Lord. Amen. Why, when he does that, why doesn't that just remove all the garbage? And I understand yeah. from a sanctification standpoint, right? Like, I, I understand right. we we'll work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and the repentance is like a spiritual discipline that needs to constantly be part of our lives as Christians. Mm-hmm. So I get it all in, I get it all. I totally get it all. I just yep. want to ask the very obvious question. Like why doesn't, when mm-hmm. God just show up, why doesn't it just kick them all out? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that, that's still the same question in another way. When I'm saved, why does God not just remove all my sinful struggles? And when right. I'm saved, why does God not just undo all my worldly inclinations? Like Jesus didn't come with Adam and Eve, mm. right? Like uh, there is there is timing to this and there is a mutuality where after we're saved by grace, through Jesus alone, we begin to walk with him. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, it gets to this, not being cheeky, but it's like, why doesn't Jesus just take us home when we say yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. I think it would also have something to do with um, when you own up to the fact that there's the the presence of darkness having influence in your life, it makes you immediately interdependent as a church because now you have something that I need to help me get healed. That's right. Well, and a lot of people remain hidden because what they do is now, if the church isn't safe, I understand that, but they go and say, would someone outside of my church pray for me? And then no one knows my stuff or my history. And then they don't experience grace where I see the next week and I know everything. I'm like, man, it's so good to see you. Mm-hmm. Let's take communion together. There's such power in that when the church is healthy. Um, and so, yeah, no, we, we mm. have to be interdependent, A, with gifts, because this is a, this is a wolf thing. Shepherds need to kill wolves. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I just want to do this by myself. I just, me and Jesus, and I'm going to confess my stuff and close the doors. And, and I'm like, yeah, but this is a Catholic thing. And I mean that in the 
This is Lower. a universal church mm -hmm. thing. We we need each other. Mm -hmm. That's why it says in James 5, we confess our sins to each other. That's why we call elders in, because it's a way of demonstrating humility and need versus independence and hiddenness. Well, mm -hmm. it just me and Jesus we deal with it. Well, mm -hmm. that's not how that's not how we roll as a movement. Uh, we are a, we are an interdependent movement. We are not an independent movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess my final question, just to bring some clarity. So obviously unrepentant, ongoing sin. Um, I can see scriptural uh, foundation for that very clearly. Some of the other things like sex, like trauma, do you, and I, this isn't a leading question in any way, but do you ground that in scripture or is that, I know you guys have quite extensive experience ministering to people in this way. So is that something that you ground uh, in scripture or is that your, because the, the Bible doesn't necessarily talk about all the hows all the time. It just shows us yep. the reality. And yep. so is that something that you see there or is that just in your hundreds and hundreds of people that you've ministered to in this way to talk to us? Through yeah, it's, bit. it's, it's both. It depends on the, t depends on the subject matter. Some of it's very, very overt in scripture. So here's one of the things that's very anti-North American, but very important. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible is written to communities first mm -hmm. and then individuals second. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, uh, lots and lots of people are affected by the demonic because they come from a community that it dedicated itself to the demonic and they've become Christians. And they're like, well, this isn't fair because, right, like I, I didn't make that decision. Mm -hmm. Well, Adam made a decision for all of us and we're still living with it, right? Mm -hmm. he, he represented us. So there are multiple people, if you want to use the word generational sin, there's a lot of baggage to that, that I think mm -hmm. has biblical rootage, where it's like in a community, if a community, ethnic group, tribe, or city or environment begins to invite, participate in a certain thing, the demonic will begin to have stronghold or authority in a family unit or in an ethnic group or in a community, which I think is like very rooted in scripture, but is very, actually very anti-American very, it's, I'm the individual. I determine my future. Well, that you can say that all you want. That's like a grenade going off in the room and saying, but I don't believe in the grenade. Well, great. I'm so glad, but you're still bleeding out everywhere. So there, are, as you start dealing with the biblical worldview of community, then individual, uh, you start seeing this very much so where I've had many, many experiences where the demonic have said to me, well, I have a right to be here because of their grandfather. I have a right to be here yeah. because of the ethnic group. I have a right to be here because I'm the household God of this ethnic group. And who the hell do you think you are? And I'm like, well, I'm just no one, but my boss is someone. So this conversation, <laughs> yeah. you know, well, I just read Ephesians one. I, you know, it's interesting. I always say to the demonic, are you stronger than God, the father's predestination? before the beginning of time. And they go, no. And I said, are you, are you stronger than the work of Jesus at the cross? No. Are you stronger than his intercession happening now? No. Are, are you stronger than the seal that's permanent until the day? No. Well, then you have to leave. It's always, you always have to root uh, a person's freedom in the Trinity's action because th th then you're not at the table. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you have a boisterous personality. It's irrelevant. It's actually the person uh, you know that sets them free. <laughs> So in that moment, you're talking to the demon in somebody. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Ha yeah. Having a conversation. Yeah. You just jumped right into Sometimes. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Not always. Sometimes. Yep. What's that like? Uh, sometimes it's wonderful. Sometimes it's awful. Yeah. Can you tell? Depends on the like, is there like a change in voice or like? Oh, sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it's absolutely not the same person's voice, male to female or all that stuff. And sometimes actually many, many times people actually hear in their mind what the thing is saying and they'll just say, well, it just said this to you. And it's it, ha ha funny, not funny. But, you know, like I always say to people, hey, listen, like, you know, you don't usually want to tell your pastor to F off. But if you hear that, you're, you're allowed to say it. And and it's just wild how many times people will I'll say, like, in Jesus name, where must you go? And the person who is an elder or a pastor or a worship leader will go, oh, we're going to hell. And I'm like, no, no, you're not. You're, you're going to go you're like, it's just, it's in third person mm. and it's their voice, but it's in third person. And they would never say that thing. Like, and sometimes there's nothing. Yeah. It's, it's all over the place. You just have to discern. Yeah. Yeah. You need to yeah, discernment. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Wild times. Ah, uh, yeah. This is so I'm. <laughs> I have so many questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me ask you one more question. Sure. Um, like I hear that, and I hear, and I've. I would say there's been a probably two or three times in my life where I've, let's say, seen or encountered someone that I would would say was demon possessed, right? Um, or or demonized, right? Probably both. Pro- probably probably yeah. weren't a Christian, right? Pro- yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um. I, in America, I think people hear demon possession and they hear this kind of, even to hear like you talking about having a conversation with a demon inside of somebody, my head goes to like Bob Larson, really intense, extreme, loud, super charismatic, like, cause that's what I've seen Who's in Bob that, Larson? in that space. You know, you know what I'm talking yeah. about when I say Bob Larson, right? Yeah. I can't believe a person your age even knows who he is. You know, man, I got I, years old. I, I, I hardly know who he is. Okay, right. Who's Bob Larson? Uh, Don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll we'll link to him in the win. show notes. No. Um, so, but that's what my mind goes to is that kind of. No, doesn't help, need to be like that at all. Yeah, so, so I guess maybe help make this sound. Um, Normal? Yes. Well, don't overly do that. Don't overly do it. In, yeah. No, no. It's, it's no, here, the, like you're talking here, I'm gonna, about I'm it. Gonna I'm, gonna eat my I'm hearing you talk about it and I'm going, yes, this is, this is incredible, right? Um, I've just never seen that done practically in that kind of way. So I don't yeah, know if I'm well, answering a question or if I'm just asking no, you no, to that's great. You know, talk more about it. One, one of the most important things always to realize is this, is um, Jesus never made this a show. And his, he had profound care for the person. This is someone's kid. This is someone's daughter or son. Like, this is not a show. Like, there's that example in the Gospels where a, a father is desperate, right? And, and, and it says that Jesus took him away from the crowd and they talked. Then the crowd showed up again. And so here, here's the thing. We just realized over the years that, number one, we need to lead people to Christ. Number two, we need to cl- – when you close all the doors and people are open – and have done this, and the doors are closed, and they repented of sin, the demonic lose their grip and their power. So all the show all the show doesn't need to be that big. Because mm-hmm. when there's no power around, they have nothing to hold on to. And not only that, lots of times, sometimes there's a show, sometimes there's not. But remember, this isn't, the, the danger is we think we're bringing ourselves to the table. I'm going to take this thing on. I'm not taking this thing on. Right. You know, the sons of Civica. I was going to say, you wind up like that that guy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, no, no. Like, you know, Jesus who Paul is preaching. Mm -hmm. No, this isn't a fight between me and that thing. It's a fight between the one who's possessing me and who's in that person. It's a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. And yes, sometimes there's fireworks, but sometimes there's not. And here's the truth. Forget the America thing. There's just as many people demonized in America as there is in China. Mm -hmm. We got to get this, especially out of white thinking churches that this is somehow an ethnic thing. It's just, it's A, racist, and, and B, it's just, it's crazy mm-hmm. because we live in the same global world and the conditions spiritually are the same. The entrance points or the expressions might be different, but the reason why we don't encounter much of this in our churches is because we don't deal with it in our churches. We just don't deal with it. We don't talk about it. We don't legitimize it. And we also don't give people the categories to even talk about. So what you just demonstrated is so interesting because you were like, oh, my goodness, like how, how would I, how, what? Mm -hmm. Well, just give 20 examples in a sermon and you'll have a lineup for four weeks that you can't deal with (laughs) because they're all in your church. Mm -hmm. If you say, if I got up in your church and I was preaching, said, hey, by the way, if you've been pinned to your bed at three o'clock in the morning and you're trying to say Jesus's name and for some reason you can and it feels like an eternity in your mind, you're saying, trying to say Jesus, and you can't say it. You just feel pinned. Then you wake up and, and then you say Jesus and then this thing leaves. People would be like, I, I've had that. No one's talked about that before. What? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, it's just there. There's lot, lots and lots of people we have these huge underground rivers of experience in our churches that we just don't talk about, not because we don't want to. Well, some churches don't want to. Just we don't talk about them. But when you begin to listen to how, how people have experienced things, it's like trauma. If you start dealing with trauma in your church and say trauma looks like this, 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 and this, people go, oh, that that's, that's my story. I didn't know that was that. Mm-hmm. So part of the role of pastors is not to dismiss experience. Mm-hmm. It's actually to legitimize and discern and interpret experience. 
And so a lot of times, if if you don't think this is possible, you don't even go there, right? Mm -hmm. When you go there uh, over a long period of time, you realize some of this is really weird and some of this is really, really normal. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a great example from years ago, just because. I was 19 or 20. I was learning how to preach. I was at a Christian camp. It was a Thursday night. This is like a really conservative camp. So evangelical free Southern Baptist sort of camp. I'm walking on my way to preach at a, like a chapel. And a voice says to me, worship the moon. I'm thinking to myself, that's like, that's just the, what? Like, I'm not on drugs. I'm not hungry, angry, lonely, tired. That's just a, now, if you know anything about moon worship, I mean, it's just like, it's fraught with demonic history. Mm. Now that's weird. Now, I probably wouldn't be comfortable to go to my pastor and say, hey, I heard this thing tell me to worship the moon. Because you all be like, uh, it's great. And mm -hmm. um, what cannabis store did you? Yeah. yeah. You know, Get that I, guy off the welcome team. I just want to act. Right. Right. But, right. but actually, the truth is there's all sorts of people that have all sorts of experiences that are weird, that could be mental illness, could be the tacos from last night. Or it could be something else. But if you don't have the environment to talk about it, you'll just never know. And then those people will hide it. And then you never have the conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the real key. I, I don't think it's necessarily an ethnic thing. Um, I think it's a lack of knowledge about what can cause demonization. If you don't know what causes yeah, demonization, if you limit 100%, it. 100%. But yeah. I mean, in the traditional North American church, I've heard it a thousand. I'm a missionary kid. Mm -hmm. So a th that stuff happens over there. Right. That mm -hmm. a billion times. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, no, mm -hmm. that stuff happens everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> right. Sin is everywhere. The world mm -hmm. is everywhere. The demonic are everywhere. And then I've heard, well, you know, Satan has a different tactic in North America. He's what, you know, he's really trying to deceive us through intellectual atheists. And I'm like, yeah, sort of. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. And, and, and yes. And yet. If I got up into your church and said something like, hey, listen, uh, if you um, are involved in trying to tell the sex of your child by a pin uh, to know if it's male or female, you, you know that's witchcraft, right? I mean, that, that's, that's trying to gain access to information in a spiritual way that's not from the Holy Spirit. Mm. Right, everyone? Mm. And people go, my grandmother almost did that. What do you mean by a pin? It's like a thing? Well, they lay the, over the belly of the thing. If it goes to the left, it's one, it's the right. Like th there's just all these little cultural mm. things. Or mm -hmm. I read my horoscope and it's funny. Yeah. It's actually, it's not mm -hmm. funny. Or like um, Ouija boards and stuff like that. Yeah, the Ouija board is made, yeah, that's made from Mattel. So it's no different than a Barbie. Well, it actually is. Uh, you can redeem a Barbie. Maybe. You can't redeem this one. You know, you shouldn't You shouldn't be uh, hanging out with tarot cards. Mm -hmm. But at the same thing too, like Jude says, you, shall, you also can't be going around and believing false things about the faith and also not expecting demonic to show up. So uh, it's not, listen, everyone listen to my voice. Don't be afraid and don't mm -hmm. be overwhelmed because some of you are like, oh my gosh, the world is ending. It's not ending. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. He loves you deeply. You're listening to this podcast for a reason. This is just for you to understand the world as it really is. Mm -hmm. And then to start say, how can I live a more loving, holy life in the middle of this? And the Lord in his mercy will set you free from some stuff, show you some stuff, and you don't need to be afraid. Greater is he that is us than he is in the world. It's just, you might you might have to come to the decision that the Bible is actually true. True. And maybe it's a little scarier out there than we thought. Mm -hmm. And maybe we're a little bit more vulnerable than we thought. Mm -hmm. And there's some responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think that's really well sums it up. Mm -hmm. John Thompson, thank you so much for your time. And thanks for um, shedding so much light on this often misunderstood subject. We really appreciate you. No problem. Thanks, thanks so guys. much.